You are all invited to a special live event that I've got lined up for you. I will be having a live Q&A with a Cold War US Special Forces veteran where you, my listeners, can ask questions via live chat. My guest is James Stayscal, who featured in our very popular Berlin Special Forces episode. And the event is on Sunday, the 21st of February at 2100 GMT. Just search Cold War Conversations on YouTube and sign up to our channel. I really hope to see you all there. Now, on with our episode. You know, the army stood on the front line in the Cold War. They stared down the Soviets across the inner German border. All of these sorts of fascinating stories that come out of the Cold War, this period of heightened ideological confrontation and tension. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you subscribe in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Germany has been at the heart of the British Army's story since 1945. After the Second World War, the Army helped rebuild a devastated and divided nation. It provided protection during the Cold War and later used Germany as a base from which to deploy troops across the world. Foe to Friend is a major exhibition at the National Army Museum in London. It follows the lives of British soldiers in Germany over the past 75 years and looks at the changing relationship between Britain and Germany and charts the gradual transition from foe to friend. Enjoy an expert visit as Cold War Conversations co-host James takes you on a tour with lead curator Peter Johnston as well as some fascinating archive recordings that have been kindly provided by the National Army Museum. Now, I could really use your help to support me to continue to produce these podcasts. A monthly donation of $4, three pounds or three euros via Patreon will really help. Plus, you get a great Cold War Conversations coaster. But don't take my word for it. Hear from some of our Patreons. This is Mark in Nuego, Michigan, USA. I support the Cold War Conversations podcast because this is fantastic history, textured, in-depth, real stories, first-hand accounts of a defining period in our history. If you'd like to learn more about supporting Cold War Conversations, just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If a financial contribution is not your cup of tea, then you can still help us by leaving written reviews wherever you listen to us as well as sharing us on social media. So, back to today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome James and Dr Peter Johnston to our Cold War conversation. What we look at is that story of this really crucial part of the British Army's history, which actually we don't often talk about so much. And we look at that from when the Army first breaks and fights its way in by tooth and by claw into Germany in March 1945, jumps across the Rhine, largest airborne operation the army's ever done, to when the army raised, lowered the flag on the last British garrisons there and brought the last combat unit home last year. So this is both a historic but a really current exhibition. But what's also really important is we cover this really significant period of the army's history where you know the army stood on the front line in the Cold War. They stared down the Soviets across the inner German border. You know they butted up against the Iron Curtain. They had guys rolling around behind it, you know, w- working out Berlin. They were walked on the, the wall. All of these sorts of fascinating stories that come out of the Cold War. This period of heightened ideological confrontation and tension. And we use ordinary soldier stories, we use iconic objects of the period to, to tell people just what that was like, to, to help them understand a little bit better uh, and really appreciate what the army managed to achieve and accomplish during the Cold War. So would one way uh, to look at this be that this is the exhibition that accompanies the book? Yeah, I think there's a great way of looking at it. Uh, you know, originally the, this was supposed to come follow hot on the heels of the book, actually, and we were going to launch this on VE Day, but uh, for obvious reasons that, that got put, put paid. But this brings a wonderful texture, a 3D uh, material culture to those stories that I uncovered in the book. And I've always seen the two as working hand by hand, really. You know, we begin to unpack stuff in so much more detail, but here you can get excited by the stuff. You know, you can see this really brilliant stuff, whether it's bricksmiths and the really cool like, objects related to them, or whether it's some of the smaller materials 
material that, that would have been so familiar to soldiers, a, a Socksmith card they would have used to spot the Soviets rolling around the, you know, Western Germany, or items from, from Berlin itself. You know, this is where you can see that. You can get really up close to that history, and you can, yeah, dare I say it, you can, you can take yourself back to the Cold War for a, for a short time. So you might just be able to hear in the background uh, the sound of a newsreel uh, of when the British Army arrived in Germany as conquerors. And if we walk around the exhibition, we go from being conquerors to then being allies. Yeah, and so our, it's really important that our story begins in 1945 because you have to understand what that relationship is like. You know, the, the British conquer Germany and they very much enforce that on the local Germans. Uh, and for Montgomery, this was the beginning of a long occupation that was designed to effectively stop the Germans from ever dominating Europe again. You know, he, he, he himself says, we've now won the German war, let us now win the peace. And initially that was going to be done with their allies from the, from the war itself, you know, France, the United States and the Soviet Union. But obviously, uh, as your listeners will know, in the aftermath of the war, those ideological tensions that existed between the victorious powers that had been put to one side for the duration of the conflict rapidly re-emerged themselves. And so whilst we look at how the British are establishing themselves in their, in their zone of, of occupation, you know, the, the material culture they bring with them, the, the currency they import, the lifestyle they import, some of the things they do in relation to stuff like denazification, we rapidly look to what that wider geopolitical situation is. You know, you can see on the wall behind you here this map looking at the different, different zones of occupation uh, that were originally agreed very peacefully between the Allies, but then become essentially the, the site of a potential future war. And then ultimately we jump in pretty quickly into what becomes the first hostile, overtly hostile act uh, 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 in Germany, which is the Berlin Airlift, where the Soviets essentially blockade Berlin in an attempt to really test the metal about what the Allies is. You know, they're, they're pushing them. You know, are the Allies going to stand uh, and fight for, for Germans so soon after the end of the war? Or are they going to roll over and let the Soviets just keep rolling through? Uh, and, and this becomes a really key waterstone moment, not only in the changing relationship between the previous Allies, but in the changing relationship between the British and the Germans. But before we go around the museum, let's pause and hear from some of those who were there in the early days of the Cold War. Initially, there was very little empathy for the situation in which the Germans found themselves, as Michael Sissons of the 13th, 18th Royal Hussars explains. Very good to say about Germany in those days. I mean, you were not, you were not saying, God, these wonderful people, they did terrible things ten years ago, but my God, they're doing well now. None of that, absolutely none of it. We were, we, were, we were not in a friendly relationship with them at all, I'm sorry. I left Germany still hating the Germans because of what they'd done to my family. And over time, opinions started to soften. Here's Douglas Godfrey Cass of the Royal Horse Guards. Of course, everybody had animosity when the war was on. Later on, you could only think to yourself that it's over... You could have to give them a certain amount of time because they had nothing, and and it was, it was oh, so bad to see them, and they they were so thin, they had nothing. And as William Stallybrass of the Intelligence Corps explains, there was initially a non-fraternisation rule, something which was to change greatly during the course of the Cold War non-frat uh, uh, rule. We must not fraternize with uh, uh, Germans, only talk this business. And we had taken over the whole village and surrounded it with barbed wire. The inhabitants had been turned out and found accommodation elsewhere locally. And the housewives were allowed in each day to clean their own houses for us. And finally, let's hear a German perspective from Siegfried Eckstein who was a young boy when the British first arrived. It was just the time when the British army moved in to the Herbert barracks. So I was a little boy. I asked them uh, in front of the barracks, uh, have you chewing gum? First English sentence, or have you chocolate? Let's return to the exhibition and hear from Peter how the Allies did come to the aid of the Germans as the Berlin airlift began. When it came to supplying the city, it was essential that anything, anything that could be put in the air was done. You know, the air corridors were absolutely full. You know, the British and Americans are landing a plane every 60 seconds at one of the Berlin airports or on the water. 
uh, and they're bringing in essential supplies. And those are essential supplies not only for the British, but also for the West, West Berliners too. And, and as you move around the exhibition, we move to uh, something that I saw at the National Army Museum probably 15, 16 years ago, which is one of the original Bricksmith cars. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, this car? Yeah, so I love this car, uh, and I love this vehicle. And actually, th- th- this, ca- this, this car was actually on display at a different museum, uh, and I was absolutely desperate to bring it back in to, to, to us to tell this story, because, you know, if we weren't going to bring it in now, when, when were we going to do it? But this is an Opal Senator. This was used by Bricksmiths. Your listeners will be very familiar with, with, with Bricksmiths, you know, and, and, and their very specific role in initially as a liaison organization with the Soviet Union, but then taking on that intelligence gathering, almost espionage role when the Cold War begins to get particularly frosty and the Iron Curtain goes up. And this car is brilliant because, you know, just to, to the casual observer, it looks like a rather beat up saloon. Uh, that you might see, you know, on, uh, you know, as, as sort of the before and after on uh, We Buy Any Car or something like that. But actually, this is incredibly significant because this was the car that the tour operators used to, to get around. And they made several key modifications to it that aren't necessarily immediately apparent. So, for example, gentlemen, you'll be able to see it, it, it's got its matte colouring. And that was designed to make it non-reflective so it can move through the darkness, so it can get close to Soviet convoys and assess them properly. Likewise, it has curtains so it could dim the interior. All of the interior surfaces are stripped back, so there's no metallic glint or anything like that. You can see we've actually mocked it up, so there's one headlight covered, one headlight uncovered. That was designed to maybe convince people it might be a motorbike travelling at night. It's got four-wheel drive, it's got enhanced suspension, it's been tuned up. It's got a bigger fuel tank, so they could basically drive this thing for days at a time, constantly. They could speed away from any difficulty they got into, but also they could get really close to their targets of opportunity, which was intelligence gathering. That was either Soviet armoured convoys, it was... uh, uh, Soviet uh, ammo dumps it was Soviet gunnery ranges it was you know the, the fields after the Soviets cleared off after their exercises to go through basically the rubbish they left behind and their, their SIGINT some pretty disgusting stories that come out of Bricksmith I'm sure some of your listeners might be familiar too about just what some of this uh, discarded uh, paper signal stuff was used for but this is what they did and they went through it and they combed through it and they built this really comprehensive picture about what it was the Soviets had and what they could do with it because, you know, the, the British knew that or assumed that war was, was coming with the Soviets. For them, this wasn't about an if, it was, it was a when. And they knew that being outnumbered three to one, the way in which they were going to do that was through rigorous training, maybe which we'll talk about in a little bit later in the exhibition, but also through accurate intelligence. So they needed to know what the Soviets could do and how they were going to use their kit. Uh, and Bricksmiths were absolutely essential in that. Uh, and, you know, it's a small unit, but they had a big impact. And they were unique, and they were unique in Germany. You know, I don't think there'll ever be a unit like this ever again that the British ever have. So it's great that we can talk about it in the exhibition. And not only with the car, but with the other cool objects and stuff as well we've got over here. If you follow me, I'll, I'll show you some in the, in, the, in the case. Before we go and look in the case, let's hear from General Jakobsen of the Bundeswehr about some of the broader implications of the arrival of the British in Germany. The first headline is Photo Friend, the miracle of overcoming the wounds, the scars uh, of World War II is, is, is one of the big things. And the army played an important part in that. Uh, army and soldiers very quickly going down from occupation force, force into living in the German community and building the relations um, that we had that spread far beyond camp, uh, camp fences. With the British army and the American army, and the necessities of the early years of occupation, the English language arrived in Germany, uh, which is which is B, and English became the first language in German schools. It is the language that nearly every German will be able to communicate with you in English. Right. Let's head back to the museum. This is a, a Bricksmith tour operator's kit, is it? Exactly that. And, you know, when we talk about like, the espionage stuff, you know, we don't want to oversell it. You know, it's not James Bond. It's not like high gadgets or anything. You know, this is just like basically high-end camping gear that you'd expect to find anywhere. But there are some wonderful and, and quirky little things here as well. You know, you can see what was the most important piece of kit. Well, it was probably the camera. Well, it was actually probably a thermos full of, full of tea or, or soup or something like that, particularly during the winter. But uh, the most important sort of operational bit of kit was, was, was the camera, the, the dictaphone, so, the, and the, the, so they could basically record everything they saw uh, and 
to just build up and take all these pictures and analyse it later, both in the uh, in their offices in, in in London Block, back in the but in the Olympic Stadium complex, but also back in the UK too. But also, if, I mean, and this is one of my favourite things in the collection. I actually found sort of really oddly labelled in the museum archive and stores when I was when just reaming through, just, just going through just, just tons and tons and of, of, of all these objects and, and material. And so you see that sort of right angle bit of metal there. It looks sort of functional, looks a bit cold. That's a key to open a T-64 tank. What every camp needs, isn't it? Well, it, exactly. It's kind of like adventure camping. Uh, but yeah, ultimately, so th- th- that was, but that the Rigsman's guys had that design, they had it made, so when they got into Soviet gunnery ranges, they could open up Soviet tanks and climb inside them and see how, like, all the kit worked, see what the gunnery sites were like, the firing control mechanisms, all this stuff. And actually, we've got this group of medals down here. These were won by a guy called, uh, called Anthony Hoare. Uh, and he won his. He was awarded the British Empire Medal for actions with Bricksmith in 1981, where he did just that. He and his tour group they got inside a Soviet gunnery range. He he and his tour officer climbed inside a T-64 tank and recorded everything they saw, gathered all this intelligence, and then extracted themselves without being caught. Absolutely amazing piece of bravery, piece of skill. Um, and these medals have never ever been seen before. So I actually acquired them several years ago and have been sitting on them waiting for this moment uh, to bring them out to the public. So I'm really excited to be able to actually put them on display and let people have a look at them. But of course, we've also got, as well as the the, the, the unique and the special, we've got the more familiar stuff, the, the famous shoulder, uh, shoulders patch that goes on, the Bricksmiths one as well, uh, which always looks really great. But also we've got things like these, the mission uh, restriction signs, you know, the, the things that were put up to tell the, the, the Bricksmiths guys where they couldn't go, and then obviously became a magnet for where you wanted to go, because you wanted to see what was in there that, the, that you know, the Russians didn't want you to see. But also, you know, the, 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 these things got nicked uh, and became great souvenirs, and you know, it was a bit of a rite of passage, I think, in Bricksmiths to go out, to go out and steal one of these signs and, and, and take it back. And you know, the number of, of, of signs that decorate, you know, the downstairs toilets of former Bricksmiths operators is, is is pretty remarkable. Now, I know we walk around the exhibition. There are no end of original signs and um, memorabilia that you've you've collected. How do you go about building a collection of original signs like that? Of you know, East German halt signs uh, and such like. Yes, I mean, with a lot of uh, what, what, we, what we've always relied on here at National Army Museum, and what's so great about our archive and our collection in particular is, is this is, is is all given to us by soldiers. You know, these are, these are individual soldiers' stories that hand this stuff over, um, and so each of these things has a connection to a particular soldier who picked it up at a particular time, or it represents a particular period in the army's history that. Either myself, so I spent a lot. I spent, I did uh, ten trips to Germany collecting material, uh, and that meant both contemporary stuff but also historic stuff. So um, we've also got. We talked about the the, the signs for bricks missing East Germany. Well, obviously there was socks missing West Germany as well. The reciprocal mission, uh, and that sign there was made by the British to uh, to basically say areas where they couldn't go, and those are incredibly rare. And I actually picked that up only a couple of years ago. It was on a wall in a ne- semi-neglected building in one of the barracks that was still left in, in, in British hands, and I picked that up there. But my predecessors as curators here went and, and, and picked up this material too. And, you know, as is always the way when you put these exhibitions, you never struggle for what you want to put in. The, the big discussion is about what you leave out. Uh, and, but we knew there were certain things that we wanted to put in. Um, Wolfgang's bratty van had to feature somewhere, you know, absolute icon of the Cold War, a living legend in his own time. So, so tell us about the uh, Wolfgang's van, because there's a full mock-up of it, and uh, it features on the, the front cover of the exhibition um, pamphlet and online, a blue Mercedes van which looks like it's serving food out of the back. Why is that a legend? I mean, I, I think if you speak to anybody who spent any time on the Soltau trading area uh, throughout the Cold War, and they will remember Wolfgang uh, brightening up some pretty dark and miserable nights, uh, or some dull tedium in, 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 on an exercise by, by turning up and ringing his little bell. You know, it was amazing. You could figure out exactly where all the British units were in hiding and uh, in their supposed camouflaged areas. Uh, but Wolfgang Meyer was a very enterprising local German who basically spotted a gap in the market. You know, thousands of British soldiers training in Germany, um, living off pretty rough uh, in some stages, well, how could he make their life better? Would, would they pay for decent food and a, cu- and a couple of beers? You bet they would. Uh, and so he fitted out his van and he'd, he'd take his van onto the training areas amongst the armoured vehicles and, and this sort of thing. Occasionally he gets stuck, occasionally someone would dig him out uh, and he'd reward them accordingly. Uh, but he was an absolute feature of life in Germany. And he's not the only one, but he's probably the most famous of the train. But all the training areas had these particular legends. There was Senneberger. 
uh, again, a similar thing in the Senelaga training area. Um, there was the steps that Vogel sang, uh, haunted buildings on uh, in, in supposed where well, Nazis have supposedly done experiments and all these sorts of things. And this was part of the fabric of life in Cold War Germany for the British Army. This is what they lived every day. You know, this is everything was geared towards training for fighting for when the Third Soviet Shock Army came rolling across the you know, German border. And, you know, if you listen to the accounts at the time and you can hear them as you go around this exhibition, um, you know, people talked about knowing that they would probably die within a very short space of time. But they were damn well going to stand and fight. Uh, and they were going to make sure that, you know, they, they held the Russians up for as long as they could. Let's hear from some of those who were going to stand and fight, starting with Lieutenant Colonel Dan Wilde of the 14th, 20th King's Hussars. Our doctrine and... Everything we were taught was, you know, these nasty Russians, if they come, they're going to, 80% of the British army is there, is to, you know, stop them. And um, it was a buffer before they got to the United Kingdom or before they got to the, you know, the, the, the ports of France. And hopefully by then somebody would have been able to do something politically. And let's hear again from Michael Sissons of the 13th, 18th Royal Hussars about how tense the situation was at times. You were get issued with a, a password which changed every day. And if the phone went and that password was uttered, it meant that the Russians were, were coming over the border on our watch. The whole regiment had an hour, theoretically, to get out of Wolfenbüttel and start herring west. And had the Russians attacked? Estimates of longevity were quite grim, as Jim Toms at the Royal Corps of Signals explains. The assessment was we had about 30 minutes and we'd be dead. You, you know, so you were, hot, you were hot as you could be on your NBC drills, you lived in the damn stuff, it was awful, especially in summer, not too bad in winter. Summer was absolutely dog awful. Once again, let's head back to the museum. So, so help me understand, how large was the British Army of the Rhine? What was the British military presence in... West Germany and then the unified Germany. How did that change from 1945 up until relatively recently when the, the last soldiers left? So, obviously in 1945 with, with 21st Army Group, which is, which is made up of, 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 you know, of, of both British and, and Canadian troops and a host of other nationalities as well, you've got nearly 750,000 soldiers in that. Um, but quickly demobilization begins to take place, soldiers go home. But when the Cold War begins, suddenly it becomes apparent that the, this is where the this is where the Cold War is going to basically be fought and won. This is going to become the front line in the Cold War, and this is really the only time when the British and the Russians stare each other down in proper close proximity uh, in the Cold War. You know, there are yes, obviously Korea and, and, and places like that where the war turns hot, but it's never really it's never really the, the Soviets and the British staring themselves down in the same sort of way, uh, and. It becomes pretty obvious for the British that they're going to need to maintain a, a really strong presence in Germany. And, and they talk about, and basically they, they set that the limit's going to be no lower than 55,000. So it'll be 55,000 soldiers based in Germany. And that is about half, that's nearly half the army. This is, becomes exclusively, almost exclusively, the British Army's effort throughout the Cold War period. Particularly as the, particularly as the withdrawal east of Suez takes place after, after 56 and then the, the sort of the, 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 the decolonization campaigns. You know, the British Army retreat more and more into Europe and then Germany becomes their sole focus. This is where the, the, the doctrine is developed. Nigel Bagnall develops brand new doctrine for how they're going to fight and win. Uh, this is where the kit is tested. Even the kit that the British Army still use today is tested and, and proven in Germany in, in big trading exercises. And it's absolutely essential. And it's a wonderful place for the British to train. Um, the 443 system that exists means they can basically go anywhere and do whatever they want. Um, they can pay for, they're obviously, they pay for any damage they cause. But it's a freedom and it's facilities. They simply just do not have anywhere else, not in the UK, um, potentially in Canada, but it's so, obviously, the, the infrastructure and the logistics of actually getting there are much, are much more challenging. And for the British in particular, based in Germany in such large numbers and in the garrison towns, and you, you can see a map that has all of the, the, the towns and, and garrisons and units where they are. They are training on an area where they expect to fight. This is not like in latter day training where they, you know, they'll use, they'll use the Senelaga training area or they'll use Salisbury Plain and, and, you know, they'll train there as if it's Iraq or they'll train there as if it's Afghanistan. This is them training on the, in, in the exact spot they expect to fight. So they know what their defensive plan is. And it's, that is unique for the British, I think, in their history, in the British Army. 
and that's why it beca- and that's why it's so important. And that's why we really want to tell this story because so often we look, I think we look back with hindsight on the Cold War and we say, oh well, it would never, you know, it was never going to happen. Um, you know, everyone knew what was at stake, but actually we know, you know, from deeper exploration, how close they actually came to war on several occasions. You know, you you talked about that brilliantly in the podcast before. Uh, and this is what the British Army lived with, and this is what they they, they lived in the shadow of, um, and that's why we've got the nuclear biological chemical suit guy there. That's why we've got the survive to fight uh, pamphlet. This is the reality of their lives, and it's what they're dedicated to. It was a true profession, and they were incredibly skilled, and they spent a lot of time training and practicing for these skills and drills. But also unique to um, the time was the scale of the exercises and the amount of soldiers that they could put on the ground and the uh, cooperation with the other allied forces in uh, West Germany at a scale that I just can't imagine that we'd ever see again today. Oh, well, I mean, if you look at something like Exercise Lionheart, there are more British soldiers that take part in Exercise Lionheart than there are British soldiers in the army today. Um, It's the most expensive exercise the army's ever done. It cost £31 million in uh, 1984, which is £100 million in today's money. Can you imagine the British Army spending £100 million and doing a month-long exercise anywhere in Britain? But this is what they did in Germany, and this is what they did every year. They, they, they were, they were, it was called the field training exercise, uh, and it was an essential part of the training calendar. It was part of uh, what General Sir Rupert Smith re- referred to as the ritual dance of deterrence. Because this is what deterrence and action was. You know, it was designed to be both, and, and I, I talk about this in the book as well, uh, and it, it's designed to be reassuring for the British soldiers, you know, that their skills are good, that their kit is good, and it doesn't matter if they're outnumbered three to one. But also it was designed to show the Russians that the British were serious, and they were, and they were good, um, and that if the Russians thought they could just roll over and just keep going until they hit the channel, then they were very much mistaken. With the clear identification of the Soviet threat, the British army and the German population grew ever closer. Here's Dan Wilde again. I just think that when soldiers come to Germany and they see a different culture, it brushes off on the Brits as well. To give the Brits the opportunity to go into a running club or a football club with the local Germans, it can only develop um, that person better. And then the chances of us ever, 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the scrapping again or you know war coming together is even less and less so, so let's keep walking around the exhibition and go past um my favorite Brixmith car uh and we've got another vehicle uh, over here a motorbike is this a police bike what is this so this is our triumph tiger uh and this is actually used by uh, to basically help uh, tank convoys run up and down the, the autobahns because the British would, would obviously move their heavy armour around, their armoured vehicles on big low loaders, and they, they, they'd run these convoys up and down. And I'm sure any of your any of your listeners uh, who, 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 who who served in Germany would be very familiar with the idea of these big big old convoys. And we had the motorcycle outriders, and they, actually these were all run by uh, a, a, the guys from the, the mixed services organisation who were nicknamed the Mojos, uh, and essentially they were poles and other displaced persons who've been left over in germany in the aftermath of 1945 and because of the change in geopolitical environment the iron curtain going up they just never gone home and so they'd stayed in germany they got jobs with the british the people who basically liberated them out of the various camps uh, and they've been brought into the fold you know they, they worked with, with, with 16 tank transporter squadron uh, and this is what they did and this was a major function they drove the tank transporters that moved this armor around they helped and facilitated the british training uh, and to all these different training areas. Um, and they were a really key part of it. And in fact, they were so important that the, uh, that the Polish Eagle that, was, that you can actually see here on the side of the motorbike, you know, that's still part of seven Royal Logistic Corps uh, iconography now. That's their badge. Uh, and it, it goes back directly to, to, to these guys. Some very, very long legacies of, of, of history that sit here. So one of my uh, favourite exhibits here, which I've never seen before, is a map showing the route of the British military train uh, from West Germany into West Berlin. And I think we're going to put a copy of this uh, on the show notes. But could you, uh, Peter, tell us a little bit about the train and uh, about what it was like to catch it uh, to West Berlin? Yes, so the the Berliner, the the Berlin military train, was, uh, I think, and again, one of these sort of unsung, just 
absolute icons of the Cold War that was always there. It was part of the fabric of, of, of everyday life. Um, it was operated by 62 Transport Squadron of the Royal Corps, uh, Transport Movement Squadron of, of the Royal Corps of Transport. And between 1945 and 1991, it ran every day apart from Christmas Day uh, and for a short interlude uh, during the Berlin blockade for obvious reasons. And this was what carried British soldiers, their families, uh, uh, British officials. This is what carried them from the British en enclave of West Berlin um, across East Germany uh, and then across the border into, to, into West Germany. And uh, you can see here on the map, you know, the, the British were very conscious that this was something that this is one of the sort of the niceties that was left over for when everyone was friends in the aftermath of the war. They created all these agreements uh, and no one wanted to be seen to sort of lose a propaganda battle by, by cutting these off. That's why the air corridor still ran. It's why the rail corridor still ran. It's why the road corridor still ran. So you, again, next to the Berlin train, you can see the, uh, the Helmstedt to Berlin travel pack, which lays out the road route and the speeds at which you're allowed to go and the movement orders that had to be filled out in, 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 in English, French and Russian uh, and all these sorts of things. And the Berliner train was great because it, it was this wonderful sort of genteel environment uh, and you can and you can see in the leaflet what's brilliant is it sort of points out all these areas of interest along the way and it says off you know you can actually see Soviet tanks operating in this area and, and practicing maneuvers. <laughs> here's a bigger uh, you know here's a bigger uh, uh, armored concentration area. Um, here's a Schloss that looks quite nice. You know it's this real mixture and, and it's it's you know the Cold War especially if you lived in Berlin you know Berlin was sort of a, a British island in a in a Soviet sea. You know when we talk when we think about the Berlin Flash that that's supposedly the legend behind the Berlin shoulder flash that red ring around a black circle um, and you know they were very much cut off and very isolated but it created this unique world and this unique environment it had all these wonderful things and, and rituals you know whether it was guarding the Soviet war memorial in the tear garden whether it was you know Spandau prison and bringing the Russians in so they could take their turn guarding you know poor Hess who was who was still living in there uh, you know and, and, and these sorts of things and enforcing that on it uh, and, and that sense of defeat on the Germans um, and you know obviously then when he died they raised it to the ground and, and built a leisure centre on top of it so it wouldn't become a shrine and, and quite rightly you know, all of this was part of it, and then it's all living in the shadow of the wall. You know, everywhere you look, you could see the wall after 1961, uh, and I think that's really significant for, for how the British, you know, lived and operated uh, and, and did things. You know, they had amazing facilities. I mean, they were based in the Olympic Stadium. The Olympic Stadium was a backdrop to everything that they did, um, and they had these wonderful facilities. They had great housing, they had brilliant food, good training, all paid for by the West Berliners. You know, they paid for the British protection, and that's amazing. But I mean, one of the obviously unique things as well, which and I sort of uncovered this when I was um, when I was researching the book, and I wanted to put it in the exhibition, was the Family Rations Issue Service. So we talked a little bit earlier about the about the airlift, uh, and and how that cut up in the aftermath of the airlift. The, the British were keen that you know they'd, they'd have enough food and, f and supplies stockpiled, so they could resist any kind of any future Soviet aggression along similar lines. But obviously that would perish, it would, it would need to be turned over. And they had these huge warehouses, underground refrigeration units uh, of, of, of food and other things, uh, perishable, stocked up. Uh, and when it came to be turned over, they'd basically send forms out. Uh, people could fill in what they wanted and it would get delivered at this really cheap price, but really high quality goods, you know, because these goods were international. And they came from everywhere. You could get like Danish bacon, for example, that you couldn't get uh, in, in West Germany, but you could get in West Berlin. It was like a Cold War Ricardo. You'd have, a, you'd have a little box, you'd have your list on it, someone would take it away, and then someone would deliver everything you wanted. And why I really love this big map we've got here of, 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 of the routes is it lists, not only does it list all the routes, um, it lists all the names of where the British lived. So this is the British physical footprint in Berlin, in West Berlin. You know, this is where they, they actually, this is their, their physical footprint and physical legacy. And these roads are still there. Kiplinweg, Hardyweg, Miltonweg. You know, streets in a German capital named after British poets. And they're still there, and you can still walk down them. Uh, and I think that this is just, I mean, and you know this, and, 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 and you, know, you share my opinion, but, but Berlin is where you can still see the Cold War. You know, yes, it's foreign, it, 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 it's, it's not ancient history, but it's, it's rapidly diminishing into the rearview mirror of history. But it still has a legacy and an impact, uh, and you can still see it now. You know, whilst the wall may have gone and all this sort of thing, there's all these other aspects of it too, which, which are there if, if for, the, for the intrepid explorer who can, well, in a post-COVID environment, we can actually go places and, 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 and have a bit more fun. I think so. this map is fantastic because it really does. It's kind of map you look at for, uh, for hours. It really does plot uh, the British Army in, in West Berlin and, 
Uh, one can only imagine that if you walked it now, how different it would be. But, you know, there are no doubt signs left. Berlin was a tense and unusual city during the Cold War. And to be posted there was an interesting assignment, as Sir General John Kisley of the Scots Guards explains. There was certainly a sense of, of tenseness about it, that you, you were something of a sharp end. I don't think uh, we really thought there was a very high chance of deterrence failing at the time that I was in Berlin, but that didn't stop the feeling of tenseness that you were, you know, there was a wall around you and people were being shot trying to escape from it. It was always pretty spooky um, because this was a frontier like no other frontier, really, uh, where drama was happening, not on a daily basis, but quite regularly. And um, a, a, a very tense crossing or a tense atmosphere. There were certainly plenty of border guards around with weapons that you, were no, you knew were loaded and ready to fire. As Julia Payne from the Women's Royal Army Corps explains, life in Berlin wasn't without its fun and games. It was traditional to play tricks on you when you arrived. I once took part in one in Berlin where um, they picked up these two young officers who were riding with the Royal Anglians, I think, who were out in Gata, and they picked them up, put them in the Land Rover to take them back from the airport to the barracks. And they, they got stopped by a Soviet Land Rover, one that they mocked up to look Soviet. And they said, right, you've crossed the wire, or in East Germany now, and we're arresting you. And they blindfolded them and took them to the basement of the mess, and there was me speaking Russian, and a couple of other officers. They'd all be shouting at each other in Russian, and then they were interrogating them, and they were saying, I can only tell you my name, rank, and number. And then eventually they said, oh, well done, lads, you know, you came through that well, it's all a joke, and took them off to the officers' mess. Nor was Berlin devoid of culture on either side of the wall. Let's hear now from Jennifer Bond, an army wife living in Berlin during the 1970s. All the officers and their wives were encouraged to go through, and we used to go through in a, in a coach, and we'd go to the opera. And all the girls wore, wore their best ball gowns, and um, all the husbands wore, wore all their mess kit, and um, all we had to do was hold our closed passport up against the window as we drove through. We weren't, they weren't allowed to stop us. They weren't allowed to look at anything. And, and that was it. So it was brilliant. And after we'd been to the opera, um, we used to go out for dinner. It was the most fabulous German restaurant. And they used to have Chateaubriand and Gull's Eggs. And they had a three-piece band. And as we, <laughs> as we walked in, they'd play God Save the Queen. <laughs> But let's give the last word on service life in Berlin to Brian Smith of the Intelligence Corps. In Berlin, they reckon you could do a three-year tour and go in a different bar every night. Uh, first thing they do when you're out in Berlin, you've got a briefing because of where it, the situation it was. And they give you a list of bars which are banned, which is a good starting point. Mm. But let's head back to the museum now, and in particular the weapons cabinets. And... Uh, here we have all the weapons that uh, the British Army had in Germany from the time they arrived until the time they, they left. A fantastic exhibition of, of the rifles, uh, machine guns and anti-tank weapons. Yeah, and I mean, these are the tools of the trade. I mean, this, we, we talk about some of the, the, you know, we talk about the parades at Senaga for the Queen's Jubilee. We talk about the, the, the nuclear uh, weaponry in Arsenal. But, you know, what the British became very familiar with is, is the, 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 the minutiae of all their kit and equipment, whether that be their weapons, whether it was like things like the bridge laying, the, the logistics, all, all, all the vehicles, the maintenance that went into that. Uh, and we put the weapons in here because we want people to understand that this is where the army stayed for so long. It saw enormous advances in how the army was prepared to fight. So, you know, when the army get there in 1945, they're all carrying the, the, you know, the number four SMLE, the, the, the much loved rifle. Then they move to the SLR, the self loading rifle uh, which becomes in itself an icon of the Cold War uh, and then towards the end of the Cold War they move into the SA-80 but then there's things like the Sterling there's the, the, the general purpose machine gun which replaces the Bren or the Bren still takes decades to come out of service um, through its various modifications there's the Brown in high power 9mm pistol you know this is this was used by the Canadians let's not forget the Canadians were also part of the occupation forces uh, in, the, in the Cold War they're based in Soest 
um, but also British soldiers are carrying them for personal protection against things like IRA attack, which becomes increasingly uh, a, a, a threat in the Cold War period. If anything, a more more dangerous and, and real and possible threat than the Soviets, which is a strange dynamic. Um, and, and, and many people have actually spoken about that. And when I interviewed them for the exhibition and for the book, that's exactly what they said. And then there's also some of the other stuff as well. There's the, the, the pyro flares that were used in train in the Shamuli. Occasionally, people would fire these at other people, uh, and they never shoot because it's uh, you know it's a it's a, it's a it, it all sounds like a good lark until it's it's actually incredibly dangerous, and people would rightly punish for it if they did it. Um, you know, what, what what seems like a practical joke at the time always just never never quite turns out that way. Um, but we wanted to bring all this together, and obviously we've got your, your you know our figure of, of 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 your British Army of the Rhine soldier, SLR slung, scrim in in, in the helmet, DPM, um, and his 58 pattern webbing. Um, and that was life for a generation of soldiers. We were trying to estimate how many people had served in Germany. Uh, and we think from between 1945 and, 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 and 2019, we reckon there were about, well, there were more than a million British soldiers. And we think that that means about more than 4 million British people served in Germany or lived with, lived with the army in Germany. A huge part of not just the army's life, but, but British life too. Uh, and that's why, you know, later in the exhibition, we really talk about the families and the impact that service had on and, and living in Germany. We talk about the Nazi uh, and stuff like that. It's all really important. There is in the middle uh, here a very odd exhibition which just says boiling vessel. What is this? I mean, the, this, this, this is the piece of kit that won the Cold War. Boiling vessel is essentially a water heater, and, and all British armoured vehicles uh, were, were fitted with them, and it allowed the, the, the crew to, to make tea and cook food in their vehicle. Um, so it basically made training a bit more bearable, made exercise a bit more bearable. Um, but it was relatively unique. Um, the Americans don't have this in their, in their kit, and they're amer- amazingly jealous about it. Um, but you know, it was always very true that if, if the, the, the BV uh, didn't work, the, the, the vehicle didn't leave the the, the, the park, the, the, the tank park, uh, because it was absolutely essential. Um, it was a really important part of morale. And, you know, it would, it, it, it would help you make tea with the hot water. You could lift the lid and you could drop your, your, the, the tinned rations in there and boil them up and cook them a lot easier than, you, than getting out and lighting the stove. Um, although if you didn't put the lid back on properly, you might end up getting curried turret. Uh, so you have to be quite careful. But, you know, it was a, it was a massive part of, uh, of, armored, of armored life. And, and again, this, this is sort of a, a big part of that story you might hear the, the tanks rolling in the background there as I talk but you know, this is where the heavy metal of the army was you know this is where the heavy army this is where the heavy lifting was going to be done the the British army in this period had really been divided between between two you know you sort of had the continental heavy army which was in, in Germany and you had the the light mobile army which was still based in the UK but this is where the British army expected to fight and, and, and ultimately win its next war what were rations like for those in the field well it depends if Wolfgang turned up I think uh, but I mean, they were, you know, I think, you know, your, your, your ration packs and that sort of thing, you know, your, your, your AB biscuits and, uh, and stuff like that. It was, it, it was okay. I don't think anyone would choose to live off it, but it was, it was all right. Uh, boiling the bag stews and that sort of stuff, you know, it, it was, it was an essential part of life, but they, they, the guy spent so long outside and spent so long training. And I think they just, they, they got used to it. I mean, the ration packs now are absolutely amazing when you look at them really. Um, although it's quite funny, apparently there's there's a there's a, a lot of complaints about there's no chocolate in them anymore because obviously when the army was in hot places they didn't want chocolate because it just melted. So in the British Army, the Rhine is more than just about the soldiers who are there. It was about the families that were with them. Many times who outnumbered the actual soldiers um, in the field. Uh, here we have uh, a very happily married couple in her wedding gown and him in his uniform. Who is this? So this is the, is the wedding outfit, or these are the wedding outfits of uh, Anthony and Sigrid Kruger Jung, uh, and they met and fell in love while, while uh, Anthony was serving in Germany. Uh, they met, they met singing in an Anglo-German choir in Rintel, and then they got married in, in, in Minden, which is itself a site of a famous Anglo-German uh, victory from from history as well, which is quite lovely. Uh, and they still live in Germany, and they're still married today, and they very generously loaned us these. And we wanted to display these because we wanted to talk about the fact that, you know. Virtually as soon as the army arrived in 1945, relationships began to form between the British and British soldiers and German women. Um, and whilst initially it was resisted and initially they were forbidden from marrying German women, pretty soon, you know, that they the British began to lay down this, this this fabric of life and build homes and families for themselves. But also there was this system called Operation Union, which was established in 1946, and that deemed Germany a home posting. 
uh, the army that was the army's choice. It made Germany a home posting, which meant that soldiers could bring their families with them, which meant they could establish these communities and these garrisons. They became you know British islands in a very German sea. Um, and they imported their own culture with them. You know, things like the Nafi became really important because it was where you could bring home. And in later decades, in the later years, certainly British people became more confident in venturing outside the wire, you know, shopping in German supermarkets. But in the early years, it was an, the Nafi was the, the, virtually the only bridge with home. That and, uh, and BFBS and Forces Favourites, which used to be syndicated as well, uh, and, the, and the music that would pass back and forth that people could listen to. And... You know, garrison life, we talk about training and, and, and the rituals in there. There was equally, there were training and, and, uh, and um, same sort of rituals and garrison life for, for the families too, about the, you know, the, 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 the kids clubs and, and all this sort of stuff that was very much part and parcel of it. And the schools that the British established for their, for, to educate their kids. And, you know, a lot of these buildings are still there and many people came through them. You know, even people who didn't serve in the army in Germany, there's, as I was saying earlier, there's still this huge... Uh, cascade of people of outwards of ripples outwards that affect other people that, that went through this British system British teachers were brought over and taught in this system as well as civil servants and you know and it what was really wonderful for me doing this is capturing this 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 diminishing period in history but also this isn't the warmth and love that people had for this this sort of thing people look back on this yes it was difficult people moved around a lot but lots of people look back on these as some of the best years of their lives um, and for many people, you know, soldiers who were based in Germany, um, I know examples of, of when soldiers were, were moved back, when the decision was made in 2010 to start recalling the army from Germany and rebasing. You know, there were, I, knew, I, I know examples of soldiers who had German wives and kids who only spoke German, didn't even speak English. Um, I know relationships that broke apart because German women didn't want to move back to the UK when the army was based in Germany, which people thought the army was going to be based in Germany virtually forever. Um, it caused huge ruptures at a very personal level as well, um, as well as, as, as changing the nature of the army. And we wanted to talk about that here. Um, there was, of course, also wonderful opportunities. You know, the opportunity being based in the heart of Europe, even during the Cold War and the huge threat of the Soviet Union. You know, the families shared that, that threat. This, yes, there were evacuation plans. And we've got uh, uh, an object here um, uh, of, of a non-combatant evacuation operation. Um, but it was never going to work. And people knew that. And so people sort of made their peace with it. And I find that fascinating how sort of a culture is created with this huge overarching threat. The IRA threat uh, that, that I mentioned as well, that began to impact massively on families too because the IRA were, very, were indiscriminate in who they targeted, um, particularly on the car bombs and, uh, and this sort of thing. Let's pause our tour of the museum and hear from some of those who live with the threat of the IRA. Here's Julia Payne again. We were far more worried in Germany about the IRA threat. I mean, if you think about, um, you know, those things you have to do on risk assessments, likelihood and seriousness. Nuclear war is highly unlikely, but very serious. An IRA bomb is less serious, but much more likely. So whilst we were in BAR, we didn't get into our cars without looking at the foot with a mirror. IRA activity didn't only impact the British Army. It also impacted German civilians. Here's Frank Faust, a German civilian who ran a printing business whose main customers were the British Army. Some wives of soldiers uh, worked in my firm and we had to check the vehicles when they left, uh, take them a look under the car, open, uh, open the car. And, uh, like it was... In camp, I had to do the same in my firm. I had the problem that uh, when I was in the sergeant's mess, somebody came and said, uh, could you please move your car? Uh, we think uh, there is a bomb in the car which is standing beside yours. Uh, I said, oh, first you find the bomb, then I move my car. And as Annie Phillips, a teacher at various British army schools in Germany, explains, changes were necessary to combat the IRA threat. At the back of your mind, you're always very conscious that, that something could happen to the kids or you know, to you or to your husband. And later, when, when you know, the IRA was sort of targeting, putting car, uh, bombs under cars and car parts and stuff, that's when they changed the number plates from sort of German, well, British army number plates to sort of, Brit, I think, British ones or German, I can't remember. Mm. But um, that was sort of so that it, it, we wouldn't stick out quite so much. 
And here's Geoffrey Payne from the Royal Artillery and Intelligence Corps talking more about what it was like to live with the IRA threat on a daily basis. There was a barracks in Munster where every lunchtime about 40 people used to go up for a run. And uh, they were warned that you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do it at the same time every day. And you should change your route, etc., etc., etc. And uh, one day they found uh, on a security patrol, they found a bicycle chained to the outside of the fence. And the bicycle was actually packed with explosives. So they were just going to wait for this run to come past and, and blow it up. We're getting close to the end of our tour of the museum. So we must return to join Peter. But there were wonderful opportunities about being based in Germany, being hot in the, the opportunity to travel. You know, you could go skiing really easily for the weekend. Um, and actually, the, the British were quite unique. They were entitled to tax-free petrol uh, as part of their status, which meant that, you know, their ability to drive long distances and go to different places and explore was massive. And one of the key things that they always carried with them is they carried a BFG route planner, which showed them, was basically an atlas. But they also carried this, which was a BFG fuel map. Um, and this shows you all the petrol stations where they could fill up on all the autobahns and all the routes with their tax-free petrol and use their coupons uh, like we have also got display here. Um, it was only very recently they actually moved to an electronic card. They were still using coupons in you know, 2012. Um, paper coup- coupons, can you imagine? Paper coupons. They still rationed. They had ration cards in 2005. I mean, amazing, isn't it? Um, but the fuel map was great because... This was one of these iconic objects. I had to work quite hard to find I, mean, I just couldn't find these. They just hadn't really seemed to have survived. And then luckily, some people very generously donated them to us. But I, I, I want to show and just talk about this, because obviously you can see this one and the, and the date here. This is June 1979. And you can see all the places they can go you know, in the Federal Republic of Germany, um, in the British zone, in the former French zone, into France, obviously, and then further south into, into the American zone in Bavaria and these sorts of things, and the wonderful scenery down here the old the old joke about the uh, the british occupation was that you know the french got the wine the americans got the scenery and the british got the ruins uh, <laughs> so it, it was maybe in you know sort of, a, sort of a subtly direction the british would tend to migrate for for things but you know they had the Haas mountains and all these sorts of things as well but i wanted to show you this so this is a map from 1979 this is a map from 1991 a fuel map of 1991 and you can see a country has disappeared off the map here and you can still see the, uh, the, the annotator on the map where the, where the inner German border used to be. But obviously Germany is unified as a country here. The, the, the Iron Curtain has, has, has fallen away. And so suddenly you're in the heart of Europe and you can go to Prague for the weekend. You can go to Poland. You know, you can go even further afield than that. And, and suddenly this, this made being in Germany, with the removal of that ostentatious threat, uh, such a more wonderful place to be because this gave you such an opportunity to explore either with your family or as a single soldier you know you, you and your mates could just pile into the car and just drive off uh, and not have to pay very much for petrol to get there I think these two maps really do show the change in the landscape politically of Europe um, after 1989 um, what I like uh, also written on the side of the 1991 version is it's better to arrive late than not at all <laughs> clearly somebody's been driving a little bit too fast for Europe yeah, and obviously that one, um, that was always one of the funny things on the on the road corridor that took you up from Helmstedt up to when you when you crossed at uh, at, at, at uh, the checkpoint there. Um, you know, you had a, you had a set time you could get to up to uh, to checkpoint Bravo, which would uh, get you into uh, into West Berlin. Um, you, had a, you know, if you if you didn't get there in that time, the Soviets would come looking for you. But also, if you got there a little bit quick, they'd start asking questions too. What happens if you broke down? Well, there was a British unit that would move up and down uh, to help try and find you, but the, but the Soviets would also come and try and find you as well. Before we complete our tour of the museum, we should hear about the BFBS, the British Forces Broadcasting Service, which was an important part of daily life for the British Army of the Rhine. But when I was working, I always listened to uh, the radio and got to know um, Billy Ray Cyrus's song very well. So it does date me. <laughs> you have your different presenters during the day, and obviously you always have a favourite one. Mine was the one from about three to five, because um, he played the best music on, on the day. But um... That was the only radio station I listened to, and I had a radio clock alarm, and I always woke up to it. Um, I didn't listen to any local stations, mainly because I didn't understand a word of what they were saying, and I was just like... 
<laughs> What's the point? <laughs> that was Nina Smith from the Women's Royal Army Corps. Let's hear now the German perspective of the BFBS from Siegfried Eckstein. The BFBS uh, uh, was the British Forces Broadcasting uh, Service. Not a lot of German families listened to, to this radio station because it was more for the English families. The uh, music, the songs, uh, that was very interesting to have this, uh, this sound uh, in the radio. As we approach the end of the exhibition and the end of the Cold War, here's a clip from the BFBS as the Berlin Wall is being dismantled. I'm standing in Bernaustrasse, where the wall is coming down. In 1961, when the Berlin Wall went up, the fabric of the buildings on one side of the street became part of the wall itself, while the pavement was still West Berlin. As the East German authorities began to block up the lower windows, people began to flee and jump out of the upper floors. The first casualty of the Berlin Wall was a woman who jumped to her death from an upper floor of a house in Bernaustrasse. Well, it's all different today. It's all coming down. On the western side, to my right as I'm speaking, the West Berlin Fire Brigade are dismantling one of the tallest observation platforms that dot around the walls of West Berlin. They're taking it down, they're pulling the scaffolding apart, they're sawing through the scaffolding, they're taking off the railings, taking down the wire. On the other side of the wall, I can see East Berlin border guards digging up the ground, digging away the fortifications. There's a gaping hole as this part of the wall in East Berlin is literally being knocked down. In other places, some of the heavy lift machinery brought in by the East German authorities is just taking the wall back, just taking it away, lifting it piece by piece. And for the last time, let's return to the museum to complete our tour. With the removal of the Soviet Union and this big ostentatious threat that everything's geared towards, the army inevitably lost. Uh, you can't just create that. It has to be there for you. Um, and what I see is interesting now, actually, if you look at how, um, how the army is reorientating itself now, we're all, I think we're already looking at where the, the, the uh, it's arguable where the Cold War ever really went away. Uh, but where, where, where is the army going to be stationed now? Where it's stationed in the Baltic? Uh, again, staring down the Russians across a border there. Very, very similar to what it did for decades in Germany. And, and, and the, the, um, the exhibition concludes with a look at um, that first Gulf War. And I remember you know, also seeing uh, BOR uh, forces in uh, the Balkans uh, again. You know, and there's one little exhibition at the side, which is sort of next to a flag. It's uh, in the German black, red and in yellow. Uh, Bundesrepublik Deutschland 1993. What's this? So this ribbon is called a Fahnenband. And uh, I think it's, it's, they're kind of like colours that the British Army would carry as well. But they're, essentially they're, they're symbols of honour that bestowed on military units. And the Fahnenband is the, the highest award uh, the, the Federal Republic of Germany could give to a, a unit. And this was awarded to 1BR Corps in 1993 as 1BR Corps was essentially going through its changes as being wound down um, and, and repurposed for, for the new world in which we, the, 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 the British Army found itself. And this is significant, for, for, I think, for, for two reasons. One, because it's from the Bundesrepublik of Deutschland. So this is the unified Germany that's presenting this. Two, it really shows that complete transformation in the relationship between the British Army and Germany. You know, they, they arrived as, as occupiers, and they arrived as conquerors, and they became occupiers, then they became allies, and then they became trusted friends. And this was awarded as in recognition for the British Army service and one BR Corps, which had been the, obviously the main effort of the British, in effectively standing on that front line in the Cold War, staring down the Russians. Yes, protecting Britain, but, but protecting Germany as well. And ultimately, its active deterrence had won the Cold War for the West. Uh, and this is a, is a gift from the Federal Republic, from a, from a grateful Germany that recognises that. Uh, and as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a very simple symbol of that transition from foe to friend uh, in, in a relatively short decade, especially given the ferocity of the feeling in 1945, is absolutely remarkable. Uh, and I think it's, in many ways, it's unique. I don't, I don't think the British Army necessarily shares a relationship with countries like Germany, with many other countries. I don't think the, the, the British Army has ever been waved off with such sadness as when it's been leaving Germany in comparison to other countries. 
And so for us, it's so important that we tell this history, that we celebrate this history uh, and we share it with as many people as possible. Something which I think the exhibition does, does very, very well. How long is the exhibition uh, running for? Um, the exhibition is due to run until July uh, and, and therefore the, the, the better times that we all hope around the corner. But we may well look to extend it as well. So uh, on, the, on the one hand, please don't wait to come and see it. Please do come and see it as soon as you can. We'd love to see you, particularly any, uh, any Cold War warriors out there who want to come and, and uh, pull up a sandbag or swing a lantern. You're more than welcome any time, uh, as well as everybody else. But at the same time, we, we do hope you might extend it and be able to share this more with, with more people when, 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 when circumstances allow us. Thank you very much indeed for your time, Peter. As ever, it's a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, I come away learning far more than I did when I first met you. No, it's an absolute delight. I love the podcast. I love being on it. And uh, yeah, I- I'm just thrilled to be able to share this history with as many people as possible. So thanks for having me. And we have further information such as videos and links in our show notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now, you wouldn't be listening to this podcast without the generous support of our patrons. However, I want to especially thank our Politburo level members who are contributing a generous 30 US dollars a month to keep us on the air. They are Tony Sowards, Sam Hardwick, Nicholas Butter, Jeffrey Jones, Matthew Comstock, Frederick Esposito, Jack Madwed, Mark Libantz, and Peter Ryan. Don't forget, if you like one of those Cold War Conversations coasters and help support the show, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If you can't wait for the next episode, please visit our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War Conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.